Welcome to Netley Christian Fellowship. It's a pleasure to have some sunshine after all the rain. Um, I hope you've had a lovely day today. We pray that you would enjoy worship this evening as we come together. The notices are in the notice sheet and are available online, so please look at those. There's an interesting piece in there in terms of not just Sunday, so if you haven't read the notice sheet, please have a read of that and pray for those who are working. Um, we had, or Rooted, had a really busy afternoon yesterday gardening at Barbara Pearson's. Um, most of them aren't here this evening because people are being baptised elsewhere. Um, but really grateful for their enthusiasm and for those who worked really, really hard. Um, they managed to see almost towards the bottom of the garden by the time we finished, so there were really lots and lots of work done yesterday. Um, really appreciative of that. Um, there's a few things in the notice sheet just to remind you of. If you're planning to come to the fellowship lunch, which is next week, Please put your names down if you're not already down there. If you want to bring a dessert, and it can be male or female to bring a dessert. It doesn't have to be just a female thing. Um, there's still a list there at the back for you to add to that. Andy and Tatiana will be with us. Um, there is a special collection for Andy and Tatiana. If you want to give to that, then please speak to Ian Lawson, and he will tell you what you need to do. Um, so that you can give to them. The intention is to give that gift, I believe, next week. Um, and just to remind people as well, Jim's looking for some assistance at Lockerley with the annual setup of the camp down at Lockerley. If you, that's something you think you can help with, again, there's a multitude of tasks to be done down there. That's on the 27th of April. And finally, just in case you don't know, um, Liam Hartland had a seizure last night, Paul? Yeah, last night, was admitted to hospital. Um, we believe they may be in a position for them to be home, but can you please pray for Shane and Robin and for Liam and the other two boys as well, that they would know God's peace, God's help, God's assistance as they deal with that situation. So as we start, I'm going to read from Psalm, and I'm going to read from Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord, is in the Lord his God, who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. By the way of the wicked, he, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Let's just pray briefly and then we'll commence with worship and song. Father God, we just come before you and we thank you that you are a great God. We thank you that you are awesome and powerful and yet you are interested in us as your people. And Lord, we just pray that tonight we would know your presence, that we would know you speaking to us, that you would be amongst us. So Lord, we ask that you would be with us this evening and be with your people wherever they worship this evening, Lord, all across the world, that they would know your help, that they would know your assistance, that they would know your grace, and that we would know that you are at work. So, Lord, we just pray that you would be with us, for we ask it in your name. Amen. So we're going to start with Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. The Holy One is here. We can sing that as a prayer, because as you get further through, 
you will get the words that there's no work too hard for him. He can accomplish anything and in faith receive from him. So let's worship God as we sing together. Come to our God as we pray for our country and we pray for the church and we pray for those in our fellowship. Father God, we come before you and we thank you that we can know your presence and that we can know your Holy Spirit working amongst us and that we can know that you are here. And Lord, we come before you and we thank you that there is nothing that's too hard for you. Lord, we come before you and we look around us and we look at the society that we live in and we look at the economic situation and we look at the wars and the rumours of wars around us, Lord, and we are so grateful that we come to a sovereign God. We are so grateful that we can come with confidence in you. Lord, we confess that we have so little confidence so often in those that rule over us, and yet your word exhorts us to pray for our leaders. Lord, we pray particularly for those who seek to influence and to bring about peace in situations that are inflamed at the moment. Lord, would you give them wisdom? Would you give them help in you? And Lord, would you achieve what seems not possible that you would achieve peace. Lord, we, we pray for Israel, and we pray for the surrounding countries, we pray for those who are suffering devastation of their lives through the war and through the battles that have been fought and through having insufficient food to eat and insufficient access to health services. Lord, we just pray for them, that they would know your peace and that they would know you lord we don't understand how you can work in some such situations lord but we know that you will work your purposes out lord we pray for the ukraine lord we we pray for that situation with russia lord and we pray that you would yet bring about peace 
and that you would work and that you would continue to build your church Lord that you would save people and that you would turn their hearts to you Lord we come before you this evening Lord and we we pray again for your presence and we pray for you to speak through Adam as he comes up and opens your word Lord we thank you that we have that privilege of being able to meet in this way and to hear your word lord we do come before you and we pray for the hartland family lord we we pray that as they deal with recovery lord and as they deal with the after effects of liam's illness lord and his seizures lord that they would have patience that they would have peace in you that they would know that in their weakness your undertaking arms are around them and that you are providing for their need. Lord, we pray that they would know your presence in a special way as a family. Pray for the older boys as well, Lord, that you would, you, you would speak to those other boys, Lord. We, we love them as a family and we just pray that you would be with them. Lord, we thank you that you have placed us in a fellowship, Lord, where we have a range of different situations and abilities and where young can help old and where old can help young by imparting their wisdom and their experience and what they've learnt of you over many years. And Lord, we thank you for the work that was undertaken by Rooted and others yesterday, Lord, and we just pray to you that they've had the opportunity to serve in that way. And Lord, we do pray that you would bless that. Lord, we pray that as the young people's works recommence, Lord, this week, that the leaders would be refreshed, that they would be encouraged in you, that they would be re-energised for the term ahead, Lord, and that you would provide for them and guide them. Lord, we pray for the salvation of those that come, Lord. We long for those who come and enjoy the games and enjoy the time the youth work, Lord, that they would come and truly come to know you as well. Lord, we pray that you would seek them out and that you would find them, that you would turn hearts that are cold and transform them into hearts that are warm. Lord, we pray for those who are discouraged and those who are downcast, that you would lift them. And Lord, for those who are dead in sin and trespasses, Lord, that you would break through and that you would bring life. So, Lord, we pray this evening that you would be with us, that you would go before us, and that we would know you at work. Lord, we pray for those who can't be here, Lord. Would you be especially close to them, for we ask it in your name. Amen. We're going to continue in worship now with, with a hymn that uh, I once walked into a house and I heard this particular hymn on four different tape decks, so it tells you you're of my age, in four different locations. Um, and I didn't really enjoy that experience. I thought I've corrupted the family too well with, with something that's good and turned it into something that um, was, was not quite so enjoyable under those circumstances. But it's a lovely, lovely hymn. It's There is a Redeemer, Jesus God's own son and it says thank you O oh my father for giving us your son leaving your spirit to the work is done it was written by somebody who was killed in a plane crash actually by his wi wife but the last verse written by him um, let's sing it and praise God together it speaks very much of the trinity so let's worship together
We're going to read now from John's Gospel. Uh, we're going to read from John chapter 15, <coughs> from verse 26, and then into chapter 16, up to verse 24. And this will be the passage that Adam will come and open up to us later. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things, because they have not known the Father nor me, but I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I did not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. So some of the disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while. And you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me, and because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, is this what you were asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while, and you will not see me again, and again a little while, and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now. But I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be filled. May God bless his, the reading of his words. We've going to sing our third hymn now before we have Adam come to preach to us. It was highly appropriate. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you. Take your truth, plant it deep in us. Shapen and fashion us in your likeness. Let's worship God.
we'll put them to 16. Uh, so we're going to spend just a, a few minutes going through this, this, this passage that Colin read to us, which is so, uh, so profound and rich and deep. And really, we can only skate over the surface of it this evening. Um, but I pray that it will be profitable to spend a bit of time in this chapter. Uh, so Jesus has been telling his disciples that he's going away. Uh, profound grief has gripped their hearts. They can't quite fathom it. <laughs> they don't understand why. They haven't really been interested in the destination. They've just been grieved by the fact that Jesus is leaving them. Their master, where is he going? They don't know. Uh, in, chapter, in chapter 13, he's told them that he's going away. Peter says, where, kind of, where are you going? Jesus says, I'm, where I'm going, uh, you cannot follow me for now, but you will follow afterwards. And then in chapter, chapter 14, verse 16, Jesus has told them, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, Jesus says. Uh, at the end of chapter 15, he says, verse 26, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will, will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. Uh, and then he comes to this passage in chapter 16. And verse 15, it comes to a climax, to a head. Uh, now, but, but now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you ask, where are you, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. Wow, so there's a lot, a lot going on here, and the disciples are baffled by the whole thing. They can't really understand it, but Jesus says to them, it is to your advantage that I go away. I'm going to leave you now, and it's to your advantage. Is it really? <laughs> How can that be, they're thinking? How on earth can it be? Nicodemus would say, well, if you go, I'm not going to be able to come out in the night and find you, Jesus. And the woman at the well, in the height of the day, she's not going to be able to go to the well and pour out her heart to him and find that he knows her better than she knew herself. And Jairus isn't going to be able to tear through the streets of Jerusalem to find him anymore because he, he's not going to be here. And what about you and me? Do you not sometimes wonder how wonderful it would be if Jesus just lived down the road? <laughs> Wouldn't it be great? And you could just go and knock on his door and you could say, Jesus, I've got so many questions. Why? Why did you make slugs? Uh, well, could help me in this situation. What should I do? You could bring all of your questions. There'd be a real queue, wouldn't there, be outside his house. But how could it be to, to your advantage, Jesus says? It's to your advantage that I go. And it all hinges on this person, the helper. Have you noticed in those other verses, Jesus has been telling them about it. They've not been taking it in. But the helper's got to come. And it's, if I don't go... He can't come. But if I do go, I will send the helper to you. How advantageous it is depends on who this helper is and what he's come to do. So who, who is the helper, you ask? Well, this word, the helper, uh, in Greek is, is parakletos or paraclete. Um, and if you've got different versions of the Bible, you'll find that there's different translations to this word, helper. The ESV has helper. Some versions have the comforter, others have the advocate. Uh, some, they're not quite sure what to put, so they just put paraclete, because the word is so full that whatever word they put, you're going to only get one facet of it. He is like a legal friend. There's kind of the advocate side of things. He is a comforter, one to bring comfort and, and here to help you. He is a he, <laughs> Uh, don't miss that, okay? He's the spirit of truth, Jesus has said various times. He's the spirit of truth, and he's a he. He's told them in verse 14. In chapter 14, oh, um, he, he, uh, 
He says, even the spirit of truth. And he talks about him as being a he. You can't see the world, can't see him. Uh, the spirit of truth isn't just a, some kind of vague power or a force to be reckoned with. He's a person. And in chapter 14, he, he's called another helper or another paraclete. Another being the same of a kind, the same as Jesus, another like Jesus, okay? He's a person like Jesus. He is the Holy Spirit. He is the third person of the Godhead. He's God. And for us to understand, for us to understand why it is better for Jesus to go and for the helper to come, we have to just for a moment step out of this passage. Okay, and we need to just put this in the context of what God has been preparing us for throughout the Old Testament. Um, it, it, we should be hearing certain things as Jesus uses words like this. Let me just, if you don't mind, just I'm going to just going to throw you, throw out a few verses from the Old Testament about the coming of this person, the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit. What is it for Him to come? Isaiah 32, Isaiah says this in verse 14, For the palace is forsaken, the populous city is deserted, the hill and the watchtower will be dens forever, a joy of wild donkeys, a pasture of flocks, until, until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is deemed a forest. And then justice will dwell in the wilderness. And righteousness will abide in the fruitful field. And the effect of righteousness will be peace. And the result of righteousness, quietness and trust forever. My people will abide in a peaceful habitation. All to do with the pouring out. God says, one day I'm going to pour out my spirit. And those words there are talking about transformation of lives. I don't know, maybe this evening you feel like your life is like an empty field. It's a wilderness and it's barren. God says that the coming of the Spirit is one who's going to transform lives. In Ezekiel, uh, chapter 36, just, just take these words in, okay? God says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I'll remove your heart of stone from your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you. And I will cause you to walk in my statutes and carefully to obey my rules. And then he carries on in chapter 37. Do you remember that, that vision of the dry bones? And God says, can these dry bones live, Ezekiel? Can they? And Ezekiel's not quite sure. And then God tells them they can live. Prophesy to the breath, to the spirit. And then, um, and then God says, and I will put my spirit within you. And you shall live. God's going to pour out his spirit. Transformation of lives. Life from the dead. Uh, one more. Jeremiah 31. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor. And each of his brothers saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Uh, full access into the knowledge of God. This is what it means for God to pour out his spirit on his people. Now when Jesus comes and, he, and it's a terribly sad day, he's going to leave them, he's going to go to the cross. And he's trying to get them to conjure up these images. Remember what I've, what, the, what I've been telling you? Transformation of lives. Life from the dead. Full access to knowledge of God. The helper is coming. The spirit of truth. I'm going to pour him out. Why does Jesus have to go away? Why can't we have both, you say? I had a friend once who, uh, he said... When he was at school, they'd all line up for fish and chips. For, 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 and and the, the dinner lady would say, chips or mash? Chips, please. Chips or mash, please. And then one day somebody said, could I have both? 
What? No one's ever asked for both before. Uh, can't we just have both? Can't we have Jesus? And, well, Je- you, to misunderstand what Jesus is doing. Jesus has to die and be raised and then be exalted, raised, um, ascended to the right hand of God where he's declared Lord of all things. And he's reigning at the right hand of God and then, and then he pours out his spirit under the reign of Messiah. And then life comes and knowledge, life from the dead. Of course, Jesus has come to achieve salvation. What's he done on the cross? He's come to take your sin away. He was nailed on the cross for your sin and my sin. And then he rises to defeat sin and death and the devil. And he's exalted as Lord. He's achieved it all. He's done it all. And now the Spirit comes. And what's the Spirit come to do? He's come to apply what Christ has done. He takes all of that and he presses it into your heart. He puts it into your life. He takes what is Jesus's. And he gives it to you. It's a pouring out, an abundance of life over the church. That is why it is to your advantage, uh, brothers and sisters, that that Jesus had to go away. So that this new age, this new era of the Spirit could come. And so I want us this evening to just consider something of the work of of the Spirit. And this is a unique chapter in the Bible where we read about the work of the Spirit in the world. He's he's our comforter. He's our helper and advocate. But he's also a spirit, the Spirit. He is at work in the world. I don't know whether you've ever thought of that. (laughs) When when you've been at work and you've been looking over at your friend opposite, who's really annoying you. The Holy Spirit is at work in his life or her life. Or when your boss is... Is, is, is shouting at you, and uh, the Holy Spirit is at work in the world, in your friends, in your neighbours, in your family. And this is really exciting to take some of these things and to think about what it means to you and me. So, so, so we're going to look, divide this passage into, into three. Okay. First of all, what's the work of the Spirit? First of all, He, he shows us that we're wrong. That's the painful bit, okay. He shows us that that we are wrong. And secondly, he shows us the right. He shows us what is right. And then fourthly, he shows us God. Uh, So first of all, he shows us that we're wrong. Have a look at our our passage. Um, Verse 8. When he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. This word, this word uh, convict, uh, it's got people scratching their heads. What exactly is, is Jesus talking about here? When the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to convict the world of sin and of righteousness, and of judgment. I think Don Carson's really helpful. He tells us this. This helps us understand the word. He says the phrase is used 18 times in the New Testament, and in every instance, it involves showing someone their sin, usually as a summons to repentance. Jesus holds up our sin. So the Spirit comes and holds up our sin and our righteousness and our judgments, and He shows us that they're wrong. Not just to make us feel bad, but to take us in repentance to the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, He shows us our sin. It's really hard. Paul's been leading us through the Beatitudes, which <laughs> go through these very, these very stages. This is the work of the Spirit in the world. He's showing us, he's showing the world its sin. What does that look like? Well, I could tell you you've got sin, and I could tell you I've got sin. But the Holy Spirit's doing more than telling you that you've got sin. What does he say? He says, I will guide you into all the truth, into all the truth. He didn't just guide you to the truth. 
He could just take us to the truth and say, look, you've got sin. But he doesn't do that. He takes you into the truth that you've got sin, that you are a sinner. That is something we feel. It's not just something you know. It's not something in your head, but it's something you feel. It's something that you come to detest as awful. Um, Robert Murray McShane says, puts it like this. It says, describes this conviction as follows. It's to give someone a sense of the dreadfulness of his sins. It's to make him feel how surely he is a lost sinner. This is a work of the Spirit in the world to make people feel how utterly terrible they are as sinners. What does this look like? Well, it looks like this. Uh, go back to, um, to Pentecost. Do you remember the day of Pentecost and the crowds were out laughing and joking? They said to the apostles, these men have had too much to drink. And then in the next, the next words those crowds were saying, well, what shall we do? What must we do to be saved? They were cut to the heart. What happened? Something very, very quickly that day. They were turned from joking and laughing to being cut to the heart. That is a feeling of the dread of their sin. What must we do? They cried. I feel the terribleness of my sin. I was reading um, during COVID of, um, of George Whitfield. I had to do, I do you remember I did a little, little um, enactment of George Whit Whitfield? And, and I, I, I was reading of, of when he was in Bristol. And he, he, he advertised that he was going to do a sermon on a, on a little hill near the mines. And he stood at the top of the hill, and on the first day, a few hundred miners came out of the mines. And their, their faces were, were covered in black soot. They were big, strong, hard men. And as he preached about sin and about the righteousness of Jesus, he knew that the Holy Spirit was at work. And you say, how did he know because as he looked out over that crowd, he noted in his diary that there were white gutters in the faces of those miners. They were crying. They were weeping. What brought hard, tough miners to be weeping on a hill? It, it was the Holy Spirit at work in their heart, showing them the dreadfulness of who they were in the sight of God. This is the work of the Spirit. He convicts the world of its sin because it does not believe in me, Jesus says. That is the height of sin. If we talked about sins, we could all persuade ourselves that we were better than somebody else. But Jesus says the nub of sin is, is saying no to me. God in his love has sent his son as a saviour to save you from your sin. And the world says no, I won't have him. God sent an ark in Noah's day and the world said no. God said, sent his son and the world says no. And to feel the awfulness of saying no to the saviour of the world. Peter says you've, you've killed the author of life. Think how terrible that is. He's come to convict concerning righteousness. The world's righteousness just just doesn't cut it. <laughs> it's got a wrong righteousness, uh, the Holy Spirit will say. Did you know that in Jesus' time, uh, the Pharisees had something like 613 extra rules they pressed in upon people? All of the Mosaic law plus 613 extra rules about what they must do and what they mustn't do. And they had all of these rules to almost persuade themselves that, that they were righteous. And that God would be happy with them. And Jesus says that the Holy Spirit's work is to show you that whatever system you're following, whatever framework is around your life, your righteousness just doesn't cut it with God. I was, um, I was reading a story about a prisoner of war camp. And uh, some, one of the prisoner's mothers had sent them a Monopoly game so that they might be able to pass the time playing Monopoly whilst prisoners of war. But you could imagine what happened. 
uh, the prisoners didn't play Monopoly. But instead, they took all the money from the Monopoly board and uh, it became the prison currency. <laughs> so well, they started trading in Monopoly money. And some started to become rich and others were poor and they'd gamble with the Monopoly money and they'd buy and sell with the Monopoly money. And they became almost convinced that this was a reality, that when the war ended, one of these prisoners of war, back into reality, went to the bank <laughs> and tried to pay in his Monopoly money. And the banker said, no, that, that, that doesn't work here. That, doesn't, that currency isn't, isn't of any worth here in the real world. And whatever currency of righteousness we, we hold up or compare against other people, the Spirit convicts us. And he holds up the Lord Jesus. That's his work. And when you look at his perfect righteousness, we realize that, that we have no place to stand. We say, woe, <laughs> woe is, is me. My righteousness is like just like a filthy rag compared to the Lord Jesus' his righteousness. He convicts the world that, of, their, of judgment. Uh, in chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus has told the world that it's judging in the wrong way. It's judging according to appearances. Its judgments had led to the crucifixion of the Son of God. <laughs> How terrible their judgments had gone awry. And now, and now the Lord Jesus is risen from the dead and he's exalted to the highest place and he's Lord of all. And he demonstrates that the ruler of this world has been judged. The one who guides our, the judgments of this world, he himself stands condemned at the cross because Jesus is risen and exalted. And anyone who's in the kingdom of the ruler of this world stands condemned because Jesus has risen, and there is a coming judgment to all those in the domain of the kingdom of this world. Now, friends, this is, this is the terrible bit of the sermon, but this is a work of the Spirit. He convicts us. He makes us realize the depths of our heart to see it and to hate it, and to cry like those at Pentecost, what must I do? I stand condemned as a guilty sinner. What must I do? The Spirit's at work in your friends and in your family and your work colleagues. And he looks to you. Maybe he doesn't articulate it. Have you told them what they must do? You know, I didn't read the little bit uh, in the middle. He, uh, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. I'm not really sure exactly what that means. Uh, Carson says, I, I wonder whether it's talking about the church. You can't see Jesus' righteousness any longer. But us as the church, we've been clothed in his righteousness. And as the world sees you, there should be something that the Holy Spirit can do as he takes the image of Jesus in you. And hangs it up in front of your work colleagues and your family members and, and those around you struggling and diff with difficulty of guilt in this life. And you can come to them and talk to them about this wonderful news of, of a saviour who makes known to you what is his. And who clothes you in a righteousness that doesn't belong to you. But can clothe your friends and your family and those around you who are struggling with grief. Maybe you think it sometimes, I wish Roger Carswell was with me. <laughs> He'd help me at my workplace. He'd know the answers. But God in his wisdom has put you where you are. And he's given you the Holy Spirit. And he's at work with you. He's with you and in you. And sometimes we say the most stupidest of things. But the Holy Spirit will take them and use them. I was baffled a few years ago on Beach Mission when as, as a, uh, uh, we were teaching a memory verse to the children. Um, something about, what, what were we teaching them? Uh, uh, about life. He's come that you might have life and have it to the full, we were teaching them. And there was a man in tears. I haven't got life, he said. 
He was convicted by a memory verse that we were teaching children. The Holy Spirit took it. Uh, and he felt terrible. Show me what to do, he said. This is a work of the Spirit. Uh, and we should be very grateful for this work in the world. Uh, but secondly, so he shows us that we're wrong. But let's go forward because this is wonderful, okay? He shows us what is right. Shows us what is right. Verses 12 to 15. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. And he will glorify me. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Now, the first thing we need to do as we look at this little section is to ask, well, who, who is the you in this passage? It's really important you understand that. Who is the you in this passage? I say these things to you. You cannot bear them now. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Is he talking about you? Or you? <laughs> Is he talking about me? No, he's not. He's talking to the apostles, to the disciples who are in front of them. How do you know that? Well, chapter 15, verse 27. Um, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Have you been there from the beginning with him? No. It was the disciples who had been with him from the beginning. He's talking to the disciples. And if we misunderstand that and we think the you is you, then we're going to go through life expecting the Spirit to reveal things to us about the future day by day. We're going to be looking for fresh revelation each day. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. He's talking to the apostles, to the twelve who were front of him, not, not Judas, but Paul, who would become an apostle. And he says to you, I will guide you into all the truth. Uh, that's not all truth. That's not everything about everything. It's not about dentistry or uh, embroidery or other. It's, it's all the truth. Uh, there's a body of truth, this this, this body of truth that is, is all that we need to know, God says. And I'm going to guide you, the apostles, into all of this. So that we can know it. It contains things of the past, about the present, of what Jesus was going through. And it concerns things of the future. And it's going to be declared to the apostles, this body of truth. So, uh, first thing, we're not to be looking for fresh revelation. We're not to be kind of looking for divine inspiration of, of, about certain things. God has given us everything we need to know in this book here. And so we must love this book. We must pour over this book. We don't look for words of ex-cathedra ex from, from, from the Pope. Uh, we don't look for divine words of knowledge like some charismatic brothers or sisters might tell us. But we look... To the truth in, in this book here. The truth. Uh, but what is this truth about? All the truth, you ask. Let's just look at our passage again. Verse 13. Uh, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He's, he's not a lone ranger going off on his own thing. This is, this is God's work, okay? Uh, when, God, when God the Son died on the cross, that was a work of God. When God the Father plans uh, the work of salvation, that's a work of, 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 of God, the Godhead. When the Spirit gives us the, the truth, it's a work of the Godhead, okay? This is where you find the truth. And what does it concern? Well... Verse 15, so we've got all the truth, verse 13. Verse 15, all that the Father has is mine. 
Therefore I said to you, he will take what is mine and he'll declare it to you. Um, how much of the fa- does the father have that the son doesn't have? Uh, nothing. Nothing. All that the father has is given to the son. Look at the son. Look at the Lord Jesus. From all eternity past, he's been given all splendor and authority and glory and holiness. And all that is mine, he says, the spirit will take and he's going to declare it to you. Why is he doing this? Well, verse 14 He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. It's all about Jesus. Look at him. Look at the splendor of who he is. Look at his character. Look at his righteousness. Look at his work on the cross. Look at what he's achieved for you on the cross and his resurrection and and exaltation. Look at it, the Spirit says. It's all about glorifying Jesus. Him, this truth, this truth here in our hands. You say, what's it all about? It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, and he's wonderful. I was looking today. Now the Abbey uh, at night time is, is uh, illuminated, isn't it? Yeah, you walk past and you can see that the abbey in the dark. I was straining on my way past this after this morning. I couldn't see the spotlights. Have you seen the spotlights? They must be very well hidden. The thing is with the spotlights, it's not designed for you to go and look at the spotlight. Look at that spotlight. The spotlight is inobtrusive, okay? It's, it's, it's hidden. And its focus beam is what it's illuminating. And the work of the Holy Spirit here, Jesus says, as he comes, as he's poured out on the church, is to shine with great focus upon the person of Jesus and about what he's done, his great work that's been planned from eternity past to bring to you the benefits of all that he's achieved at the cross and resurrection and exaltation. Uh, J.I. Packer, this is a most wonderful uh, quotation. If if I may, I'll read it to you from his book, Keep in Step with the Spirit. He talks about this illustration of the spotlight. The Spirit is like a spotlight on the Lord Jesus. And he says this, it is as if the Spirit stands behind us and he's throwing light over our shoulder onto Jesus who is standing facing us. We're talking about this body of truth. Just imagine that this week as you're, as you're open, like whatever you're reading at the moment, maybe just open the pages of, of the scriptures as you come to them in the morning. The Spirit stands behind you and he's thrown light over your shoulder on the Lord Jesus who's standing facing you in the pages of scripture. And the Spirit's message to us is never, is never look at me, listen to me, come to me, get to know me. It's never that, Packer says. But instead, it's always this. Look at him. Oh, would you see his glory? Go and listen to him. Hear his word. Go to him. Go to him and have life. Get to know him and taste his gift of joy and peace. Oh, how we must read this body of truth with a different way. The Spirit is over our shoulder and he's, he's showing us the Lord Jesus, all the fullness of who he is and what he's done. And he's glorifying him in all of this truth. Uh, it, it's quite trendy these days to talk about being spiritual, isn't it? At work, uh, colleagues talk about being spiritual. They were such, aren't they a spiritual person? Has, it, has anyone ever said that to you? Aren't, oh, you're a spiritual one. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what people always mean by that word. But if you're really spiritual, that is, if you're filled with the Spirit, if Jesus poured his Spirit out on his church, on you, and you're walking with the Spirit, you're spiritual, what does that actually mean? It means this. If we're speaking of the result of the Spirit's work in our life, 
the result will and must always be a keener interest and delight in the Lord Jesus. It must mean a more fervent love and devotion for the Lord Jesus. It must mean a firmer trust and resilient and reliance on Jesus. It means a life that is increasingly yielded in obedience and service to Jesus. That's what it means to be spiritual. That's what it means to be full of the Holy Spirit. It's to be taken up with all that God is doing, has done, has promised in the Lord Jesus. Are you spiritual, friend? Are you walking? Are you keeping in step uh, with the Spirit? The work of the Spirit is to write his law on our hearts. Oh, how we must come to God's word in a different way to any other book. How we must kneel and pray before we read a word. Holy Spirit, would you show me the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ today? Shouldn't that be our daily prayer? Would you, would you help me to lean on him in a fuller way today? As I'm going through this, this time of difficulty and weakness, help me to lean on Jesus more today. Holy Spirit. That is what it is to be full of him. And lastly, and more briefly, okay, uh, we, we, we can't spend time pausing, but these are profound words, aren't they? Verses 16 uh, to 24, the Holy Spirit shows us God. He shows us that you're wrong. That's where it begins. You cry, what must I do? He shows us the Lord Jesus in his righteousness. And he exchanges our rags for the riches that we find in him. And then he leads us into his presence. I, I find this passage rather baffling. Um, verses 16 to 19. What on earth is all that about? Do you find yourself scratching your head? There's this long discussion about, about something the disciples had said a little while if you're with us a little while, then he'll go, and, and, and what does he mean? And, uh, and Jesus says, is this what you're asking that you didn't understand? And, and, and it, go, it seems to go on and on. And I'm not quite sure exactly what it's all there for, but I do know this, that it has the effect of slowing you right down. Slowing us right down to every word that's going on in this conversation, so that by the time you get to verse 20, truly, truly, Here's a big thing. Are you listening, Jesus is saying? Are you slowed right down and ready for this? Truly, truly, verse 20, I say to you now, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she's delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also, you have sorrow now, but I will, I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask in the Father's name, I will give to you. Until now you've asked nothing in my name, ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. We haven't got time to dwell on the depths of this passage. But let me tell you one thing. That this image of a woman in labour and giving birth, maybe it's an image that you all know so well. And maybe it's an image that's marred you, I don't know. It's hard. Labour, isn't it? But it's an image in the Old Testament to, to, to foreshow the beginning of the messianic age, of, of, of the Lord Jesus exalted and, and reigning and ruling. And in Isaiah chapter 26, let me just read this, this verse, okay? Oh, Isaiah looks at the sorrow that Israel is going through as the Assyrians come and attack the nation. What sorrow, he says. Oh, verse 20, chapter 26 of Isaiah, verse 18. We were 
with child and we writhed in labor, but we gave birth to wind. We have not brought salvation to the earth, and the people of this world have not come to life. Sorrow that led to nothing. But Jesus says, hang on, that image of the woman giving birth and joy coming is the beginning of the reign of our Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the beginning of all of those prophecies about life from the dead, about fullness of knowledge. The Lord Jesus says, sorrow that is death. It's a terrible time. But resurrection and exaltation mean the pouring out of the Spirit so that, and this is it, so that now, now, in that day you can ask, not, you don't need to ask anything of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, you will receive it. <laughs> Nicodemus, you don't need to come out at night time any longer. Oh, woman of Samaria, you don't need to come out in the height of the day to the well to see me. Oh, Jairus, look at you frantically running through the streets of Jerusalem. There's a day that's coming, and now has come, brothers and sisters, when the Spirit is poured out over his church, so that now as we kneel down by our bedside this evening, you can go straight to the Father in the name of the Son through the Spirit, and you can have confidence to boldly approach in the work of the Lord Jesus and to ask anything in his name and he'll grant it to you. Your joy will be full, he says. This is wonderful blessing. Our oh, brothers and sisters, we should be taken up with the work of the Spirit today because he brings us from devastation to being clothed in his righteousness into his very presence with boldness to ask anything in his name and he'll grant it to you. Brothers and sisters, that is the work of the Spirit and it's something we should be greatly, greatly thankful of. And as we, uh, we're going to close uh, our service by singing and I was wondering what song we should end with. And uh, I've chosen a song that's all about the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because that is the work of the Spirit, isn't it? To take our minds to him. And, and the chorus is one of hallelujah. One of great joy. Uh, and as we sing this, Jesus would love us to shout hallelujah. Because he's poured his Spirit into our hearts. So that we might know joy in its fullness. Inexpressible. Uh, so let's stand, shall we? And uh, we'll sing this beautiful song.
Uh, so the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.